you were like Dreamforce last week, and like yeah, you did, it seemed like you did like dozen sessions or something like that. Yeah, we had a lot of sessions. We had, I think we had, I think we had ten sessions as a company or something. Right. Uh, but but I was on a, on a bunch of them. And then we did a bunch of dinners and breakfasts and lunches. And right. you're a Dreamforce, if you're a it's a big week. application company, it's like it's your thing, right? So, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It yeah. seemed like to drive so much of like dealing activity. It really is something like very quickly. Like a lot of companies, even like investors, sometimes like their year kind of revolves around that. As a oh, show. it's such a big yeah. opportunity. Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's head outside a little bit. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Dreamforce. Uh, you really have to learn how to run it it's an art just in, ter- in terms of how to hack it what to um you know basically how to use the time well how to use your money well um you know a lot of times over the first time you do it you think okay i just buy a booth and everything yeah. works great and turns out there's all these hacks like um getting a restaurant and buying out a restaurant that's next to moscone and then you do your meetings there and right. you know figuring out what restaurants are the best places to hold dinners and yeah, knowing that the night of the U2 concert, you're going to have more drop-off in attendance if you have an event and things like that. Yeah, no, it's kind of crazy. It seems really complex, and I see a lot of marketing people kind of hacking their way through it. That's but, right. But so it's very similar, I guess. You know, the, the topic I wanted to chat with you about, everybody told me, like, oh, you got to talk to Nick about fundraising. And you oh. seem to be, like, oh boy. seen as, like, uh-huh. a big uh, a big expert on, like, a lot of that stuff. And it seemed like it's a similar thing. It seemed like, oh, lo- everybody has to think about, like, it, to think about marketing and Dreamforce and field marketing and all of that. But uh, they also... Uh, you know, seem to all have their own little personal recipe. So some people, you know, they uh, they have their own kind of way of thinking about it. And so, right. you know, what's kind of your your take on like the the art of fundraising, I guess, these days, and like how to think about that? Yeah, I don't, it's it's funny because I you know, obviously I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, and I think everyone would love to have a formula. Mm-hmm. Probably unlike Dreamforce, it's not as simple as like a small number of variables you just have to optimize. It's really a lot. It's very situational, of course, right? But I do think understanding your situation and realizing what advice is going to apply to you is a very, very big thing. Like I think a lot of entrepreneurs kind of read blog posts about fundraising and think that all of it applies to them, Mm -hmm. but it's where they are, either in the, the, the market they're in, the time that they're raising, the size of their company, their experience level, those like change what you do a lot, right? right? So, you know, if you think about a, uh, it being in a good market, if you're an experienced entrepreneur and you're going after something that's pretty clear and it's a big market and you have some traction already versus first time entrepreneur right. versus somebody going after what looks like a niche market, whether it is or not, right? right? And so the, all of this stuff really varies a lot. Right. But so I'd say the, the first thing is actually literally figuring out who you are and like what's different about your situation from others. Right versus assuming that your fundraising is going to be like everyone else's. That's like a big thing. No, that makes sense. And it also seemed like, of course, the biggest uh, one of those differences is like how your company is doing on its own, right? Yeah. Whatever yeah. stage you're at. And it's, it's kind of, um, it still feels true to my, to my mind that if your company is not doing well, you're not going to have an easy time raising around. There's no amount of fundraising as its own thing that you can do on top of a bad company to actually win around. Like, does that feel correct to you still? Well, I mean, it's funny because I, are you generally speaking, there's a, there's a, most companies, there's a range of, of, of prices at which something can get funded. Once you get to a certain stage, um, I think that, that r- the core range is defined by f- how your company's doing, how the market's doing, what the timing is. Your ability to execute the fundraising uh, determines where you fall in that range, right? So if you have a very compelling pitch, you organize your process well, you target the investors that are likely to resonate with you, you you're able to communicate with them well, you have the right team, you're gonna get the high end of that range, both in terms of range in terms of deal, but also uh, time to get it done, right? Or, or terms even. Or right? even ter- but also time to get it done, meaning like how much do you have to invest? And if you're less effective, you're gonna get in the low end of that range, right? Now, once you get to a certain point, the deal could just not get done, which is obviously a problem. But I, I think that I guess the way I would put it is your execution of fundraising determines where you fall in the range. Mm-hmm the success of your business and the external market factors determine which range you're in, right? right. Yeah, you're right. And those, those market factors are interesting because obviously, you know, when the market does better, you know, it's like easy to get money even at like an A, B, C stage, right? Absolutely. You know, later around, it's always almost based on performance revenue, yeah, like core metrics. Yeah, you know, more performance for sure. But early on in kind of times of boom, it's easier to get money just on like narrative. You know, That's we're right. going to disrupt X. Exactly. And even if you have zero revenue, you can probably get a B somewhere, That's you know, right. somebody will give you a big check. But in times, like even like right now, I wouldn't say we're in like cold times per se but it seems like it's much harder right this kind of narrative driven yeah. rounds like middle rounds are really hard to get these days and people kind of really look at your metrics so i mean that that kind of feels like in my mind that's kind of a thing that 
hopefully you've been doing already before you needed to fundraise. But assuming you have kind of okay to good metrics to great metrics, like what are some of the things you feel like really help you once you actually go into fundraising mode? Yeah, I mean, I think that one, if you've got okay, good, great, like within that range, the, and, and it, assuming that it's the right time, to reasonably good time to fundraise, I think there's a few things. So number one is targeting the right investors. That's actually something I think a lot of people don't spend enough time on. Um, you know, they, there's so many people you could target. And sometimes I get a request from an entrepreneur that says, you know, uh, can I get an intro to, and they list out like 10 people that are really totally different. I'm like, are you sure they all are gonna be interested in your company? You know, cause I, you think about that, that investor, they're gonna probably make one or two investments a year. Right. So what's gonna cause them to wanna invest in your company, right? So I think the targeting of the investor is the first thing. Second thing is actually the relationship you build with those investors. I think most people know this, but it really is, it's very true, which is it's hard to go get a deal done with somebody you met for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now it's very, it's possible. It doesn't, it's not like it doesn't happen. But um, you know, it's not. It's more. It's easier if they've known you for a while. Right. And so, really thinking about how you build relationships ahead of time in an authentic way, how to get people to uh, you know kind of see the progress of your company. I think uh, Mark Suster wrote that post. Uh, he invests in lines, not dots, which right. I think is very powerful. Where he wants to see some a company kind of progress over time. So the second thing is really getting to know people over time. Now that's it's hard. Like usually when people start thinking about in fundraising, they they have to raise money. So you have to do this sort of before. Before you have to raise money. Now, the third thing I think is understanding the sequencing. Now, this is where there is some art, right? There's some thinking about: uh, Am I going to try to do all this together at once? You know, am I try to organize it so they happen at the same time? Versus, am I going to do this serially over time? There's a little bit of balancing those two. Like, on one extreme, you've got like meet with one firm, then the next week when they meet another, then the next week meet another. That's not very effective because you can't get like a process where things converge and where people feel like something's gonna happen. On the other hand though, I've seen entrepreneurs be like, I'm gonna meet with 40 firms all at once. And the problem with that is number one, it gets around that you're shopping around your right. deal and it feels like you're not very targeted. Number two, um, if all of those people say no, you're kind of in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would say there's a balance of like finding a small number of firms that you feel like there's genuinely a good fit based on personal relationship, based on the, their interest in your sector, and then doing that in a concise period of time. So that's the right. next thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that personal relationship is something I hear like so often, but I think so many entrepreneurs do wrong of like, talk to like investors even when you're not raising money, yes. particularly when you're not raising yeah. money, when you have no pressure, when you can kind of give them access to whatever you want about your business, any metrics, just start establishing those dots on the line, right? That's such a critical thing to be in a good position once you actively want to fundraise and devote a lot of time. Right. But let's talk about timing at like a macro and micro sense, because in my experience, those things kind of actually determine your outcomes quite a bit. Absolutely. And so it seems like there's seasons during the year where you yeah. should try to fundraise and seasons you should absolutely avoid. So Thanksgiving, holidays, it seemed like all the VCs yeah. are on vacation, everybody's skiing in like, you know, Colorado or whatever. Totally. And it's really hard to, to fundraise. And, and it seems to me like the hot season would be, you know, just before that, like right now, like September, yeah. you know, September, October, October yeah. the perfect season or early in the year, like, you know, January, February, March, right. have worked pretty well for me. So does that line up with Generally, you? Generally, maybe like? I would add one in in the sort of like April, May time frame before people go to summer. The simplest way to think about it is the school calendar kind of drives a lot of it, right? The, at least in the U.S. Right. And so I think that, you know, folks are going to be with their families and all that during a lot of that school downtime. So you really want to get one of those three windows. Now, it's not always easy, and you know, deals do happen in the summer and other times too, but I think that if you want to get the most people that could potentially look at your deal, you really have to hit one of those three windows, which again, thinks of, you have to think about planning in advance. Mm -hmm. The, the, the other variable though, that's like an external calendar factor. I think the internal calendar factor is you certainly want to raise based on when your company is doing well, right? That's, and it's kind of obvious, but if you had some amazing milestones, some amazing deals, some amazing hire, you just had your big company conference, something that's like really powerful, also consider that. And the, those things could be tied together as right. well. And that could be like a good sign of momentum. In a very, very micro sense, it still seems like fundraising is really driven by also like weekly calendars of firms and like that yeah. Monday partner meeting, Absolutely. right? And so you really have to worry about like, like when you would be go up and presenting, because you're probably not getting around without presenting in front of all the partners on some Monday meetings or a bunch of them, you know, ideally, right? That's right. So pacing that and, and timing that is kind of really, really critical. That's right, and you know, that does become a fixed block, so you have to think about if, if you want your process to converge, the ideal situation is over maybe two weeks, you do your partner meetings, right, or three weeks. Like, and you know, maybe it's one day, but that's probably pretty hard, but like at least a few weeks, you get to meet all the partnerships, you get to know them, get to feel them out, they feel you out. Um, if you have one partner meeting 
and then another one eight weeks later, yeah. the probability of those two deals both happening at the same time is pretty low. Yeah, because there's also still a bit of like, not necessarily like fear of missing out FOMO, but like oh, totally. some competitive pressure at least, right, between investors. Well, it's interesting because there really are two dynamics, right? One is the competitive pressure, the FOMO, like you talked about. The other one is, you know, if you're familiar with kind of like the lemon theory in cars, in used cars, you know, lemon theory, if people don't know it, is the idea that in some markets, the, the value of something is pretty opaque. You know, a lot of things in the stock market, the value of something is very transparent. You can right. say the stock is worth X, right? But the value of a startup is pretty opaque. And so I think a lot of uh, VCs, what ends up happening is, if there's negative signals, like for example, nobody else is interested in this company, that starts being like, what am I missing? And by the way, some investors are great, they're independent, but a lot of them may be like, what am I missing? And maybe this isn't the right company. And so if you start sending off the wrong signals, like you're too desperate, nobody's interested, you can actually kind of make people think your company's a lemon. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because at the end of the day, like startups are a very like illiquid and inefficiently priced that's instrument, right? Exactly. So that's why you get so many different weird pieces of advice from different people about different situations. And so I, I think you know that that advice is, is is really good, right? You have to think about the you know the unique kind of uh, aspects of your own situation of your own company. You have to work the timing. You have to be aware of of you know a, a price and offer a term sheet, not really like staying around forever. So that's right. That makes a lot. Sense. Thanks a lot, Nick. Yeah, thank you. It was great talking to you.